Hey there, I'm Christy from GovGirl.com, and I have a special guest with me today. This is Corey Dalton. He manages the network at the city of Reno, and he's been in government IT for... About 10 years now. About 10 years, yeah. He knows his stuff, and I would like to chat with him about disaster preparedness for government websites. Um, so government sites have gotten a lot of attention recently, you know, with all the disasters going on back east and, um, the, you know, the earthquake and specifically the, uh, the hurricane. Uh, and the, tornadoes. Tornadoes, everything. Yeah. Um, but specifically, the, the recent hurricane on the East Coast, uh, there was a lot of talk about the New York City website and about how uh, it was so inundated with so many people trying to go to the site to get emergency plans and evacuation plans that a lot of people were having difficulty getting there and downloading it and um, using that site. And so they were, they, you know, really worked to... Uh, use alternative means and, and social media to get the message out. But the thought is that uh, this is one of the things that we want to think about before a disaster happens. And, you know, we're not just talking about disasters and we're not just talking about, you know, natural disasters. What are the, some of the other reasons where government websites can, can be non-functional? They can go down for numerous reasons anywhere from... Uh, internet attacks to mm -hmm. internal hardware failure to uh, in viruses um, and, and even internal um, disasters like a, a pipe from you know a floor above you or something. Oh sure, something going on in your own building. Yeah, a lot of things. Um, even even something as horrible as an internal fire. Mm -hmm. And we have seen before mm -hmm. government uh, sites uh, going down or in and. Uh, uh, education sites going down for you know shootings and school shootings, uh, things like that. And it, it also doesn't have to only be uh, negative. I remember during the last presidential campaign uh, when McCain announced his running mate, everybody went on. I think it was the uh, Wasilla, Alaska website that went down because everybody went on there to figure out who in the world Sarah Palin was. And so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there's so many different reasons why you're government site could go down and that emergency information that you want to communicate with the residents uh, could you know be be lost you could be unable to communicate and so we want to um, address some of the reasons or or some of the approaches to take now so that when those situations happen we're a little bit more prepared I know in our own situation I would like to be prepared for the city of Reno for any you know, we see it all the time. Uh, anytime there's an emergency situation in Reno, uh, like the couple of times, just the couple of times we've had, you know, a lot of snow. And for us, a lot of snow is like two inches. I think <laughs> they closed City Hall one year because it snowed like two inches. <laughs> but um, there's, there's uh, a noticeable spike in traffic uh, to our website during those instances. And it's not enough to uh, impede people's ability to use the website, our site doesn't go down because of it, but it's a noticeable spike in traffic just for those little instances. And so we know that, that traffic does go up in those emergency situations, we wanna prepare for it. So what are the, some, some of the things that we want to be aware of? And to, if you're a government web manager, what are some of the things that you'd like to think about? Um, a lot of the things are whether or not, like if you're hosting your own site versus somebody else hosting it for you. If somebody else is hosting it, you're going to want to know if they have like a uh, burstable bandwidth to take that hit that's the, you know, less than 1% of your normal traffic load uh, to ensure that things don't go down. And uh, you, you'll want to make sure that you, if you're hosting your own site, that you can accommodate bandwidth uh, impacts like that. Okay, sure. Uh, yeah, you know, you're, you're right about that. Uh, government webmasters, it's, it's kind of a mix. Uh, whether or not they're hosting internally or whether or not they're using their uh, CMS vendor as a host for their content management system or just a, another third-party host. So, um, you know, we host our website with a third party. Used to be, remember, when we, we hosted with a different company and it was right down the street, the data yeah, center. Yeah, the same city, yeah. So if anything ever happened in the city of Reno, that might have been a, a more difficult situation to deal with because... Could have been a double mm -hmm. impact, basically, yeah. Absolutely. But uh, some of the things to, to consider if you're having somebody else host your website is you'll want to know like where 
does the server physically reside that has your website on it or if oh, right. it's, like what building it's in yeah what mm -hmm. what building what city what street so if they say that like an you know a, a disaster hit la and you'd like to know where something impacted and know whether or not your data center that you know, for your website might be in LA that you're in that in that part of LA. Or so we know specifically where it's located. Yeah, right? and and you'll also want to know um, who, if somebody else is hosting your your website. You'll want to know do they do offsite storage? Do they have disaster recovery plans? Do they have uh, hardware for business continuity? Because most of these disasters um, happen in seconds or, or minutes, whether it's a, a tornado. Or, or an earthquake or a fire and so the next day or, or even hours later you have to be able to provide service to the people that need that information about mm -hmm. where to go for services to begin to start recover whether it's sandbags for floods or, or to contact you know about Red Cross things like that. Okay so, so it's not just the act of the incident that you're dealing with in that day it's the prolonged effort of communicating with residents as well as getting your systems back up and running. So it could, yeah. you know, it could be a week, it could be more than that, right? Yep. Okay, so what exactly is this disaster? I've heard you use this acronym before, the DR. Is that disaster recovery or Yeah, that that's how do you get back up and going after a disaster is hit, you know? Uh did the disaster hit you locally where you uh host and and have some of your data and if so, how how far back do you have data that's off-site that you can restore from and, and get things back up and running. Or if if your particular problem is so large that you can't use your data center again, if you were self-hosting, then you have to have an, an off-site that can come online and begin bringing those services back mm -hmm. online for people to have access to to get the information they need. Okay, you know, I've heard a lot about having mirrored sites, and actually I was chatting with uh, Craig Terrell from the city of Tacoma Park, Maryland, and he was saying that he uses Amazon S3 uh, accounts to sort of mirror the site. Uh, do you think that's a good idea to have sort of a, a full another version of your website sitting somewhere that you could turn on? Oh, absolutely. Uh, having your 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 website mirrored somewhere else is, is always a plus. It can also be expensive, mm -hmm. um, but there are some less expensive alternatives to doing that. But the, the key is, is when you go to have the, the name resolution stuff for your website get changed to accommodate that you now are storing your, or presenting your, your website at another location, uh, the name resolution stuff can take hours or days to propagate throughout the country mm -hmm. uh, based on on how often the naming servers uh, around the world update. That's so. that's a good point, and that's that's something important to note. You know, if your uh, government website goes down and you have an idea, well, you know, hey, I'll just put up an emergency page on another server somewhere that's up, and I'll point my site to this emergency page. Well, that DNS could take up to what did you say, forty-eight hours even to yeah, to propagate. Take so. hours to a day or two. People might not see that site right away. So one of the things we were chatting about before was uh, maybe having uh, an emergency site already up, right? Yeah, uh, this is, there are some people that feel that on their main site they can have a, a some sort of a button or link that's their emergency services website that they could click on and go to and people would hopefully begin to realize that that's where they go for their their information and if they have it already saved in some sort of a browser um, that if that site doesn't come up because that may happen to be the site that went down they'll most people will think to go back to the original main site whether uh, of a city or state or, or county or whoever they got mm -hmm. their original emergency services website from so it helps if people already know that you would have two areas to look for the information in but if you're very focused on having all of your information on one one location and something happens to it it's really hard to make everybody make the change to a secondary location but if you can already train your citizens and your and your people of interest in knowing that you actually have two possible areas to look for uh, disaster type information to cover your bases then then you should be okay. So what you're saying, like in our case, uh, we could have, you know, a subdomain, something like emergency.reno.gov, and always have that point to in our, our emergency page, which the key to it is that that resides on a different server in a different location Hopefully, yeah. than, than the official reno.gov site. 
and because the, the .gov domain is all handled by um, the GSA, that's a separate thing in, in, in itself, and so I'm, I'm pretty covered with all those bases, and if my emergency site is down because that host happens to be down, then my regular site will probably be running and vice versa, so people can still yeah, get to the information. Exactly, and, and hopefully you, know, you have uh, your news services out there to where you could, uh, in the event something happened, you could have the news broadcast that all your emergency information is on, is located at this other location. So a lot of governments work with their local media to inform people when there's, uh, you know, a change in where to get the emergency information. Absolutely. And what we're finding recently during a lot of these uh, situations and incidents is that people are using social media, as I mentioned at the beginning, more and more to uh, get that information out. We heard that the um, uh, the mayor of New York was even using his own uh, personal Twitter account to get out the emergency plans information. You know, whatever works, however you need to to reach the residents. Um, but <clears throat> one final thing I just wanted to ask you about is uh, I always get mixed up on the terminology. And so what is some of the uh, good terminology that I want to ask my my host that I'm talking about in reference to what if, you know, five million people are all visiting my website at the same time. What are some of the things that I want to be asking them? You'll want to ask them uh, things like what is their largest capable uh, bandwidth that they can provide to your website? Um, maybe even what's the biggest load your website has ever had at any one point and reference back to maybe what caused that load uh, mm -hmm. and just make sure that that your, your, your hosting company, if you're using a hosting company, that they have the capability of handling um, an influx of information like that. And most of them will use burstable, which means that you're, you're usually running at X amount of bandwidth, and when something happens, it'll rate you up higher so mm -hmm. you can accept more traffic. But uh, it's, it gets to be really expensive. And so if you're, sure. if you're planning for that, you know, small less than one percent time that something could happen and and that's where you're dumping a lot of money it's it's pretty uh, uh non-productive to do that so mm -hmm. you just kind of have to do the best you can with with what's in your means and your budget and within your hosting company because it's like you said with the sarah palin you can't expect a small town like that to the run mm -hmm. yeah to be able to run at a capacity of what happened when the when the announcement came out about her they just mm -hmm. they would never think that an impact like that would happen to their website. And so it happens, but you do the best you can to prepare for it. And, and in these tight economic times, it's really hard to have full-blown secondary disaster mm -hmm. sites that you can fall back on for sure. things like that. I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of people are looking to the cloud and mm -hmm. looking at those services like the Amazon S3 account and trying to uh, leverage <laughs> social media and using all the different types of ways to get the communications out and so that they don't have to spend large amounts of money, but I think we're covered for when I decide to run for presidency. I think <laughs> Reno.gov will be able to handle it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much for chatting with us, uh, Corey. And uh, so this is a, a little bit new format to the GovGirl video, so please let me know. Comment on uh, the YouTube channel at youtube.com slash govgirlblog or visit the website at govgirl.com and let me know what you think. All right. Thanks. Bye. Click. Oh. <laughs> no! <laughs> the website is down! <laughs> that is so making the cut.